Okay, yeah, we're good. So, so Brad, if you wanna, um, if you wanna piggyback exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, Stockton is very similar to Oakland in terms of having. We have some real challenges in our community, right? We have some very, very nice areas, but we also have some real violent, you know, areas that have been plagued for years and years of years of violent crime. So, uh, and what, what I was saying about researching, you know, I don't know uh, how aware you all are is that just a couple months ago, Stockton was announced that Stockton is the most diverse city in America, right? Most racially diverse. So, um, you know, kind of unique in that way. So anyway, so what we did to, to try to, uh, you know, to get to the point of how, how, do we, how do we police an area like that is number one, focus specifically on local hiring, right? Like, you know, it doesn't make any sense to hire somebody that knows nothing about, so you hire some, somebody that wants to be a police officer and they come into this, this very unique city and they don't know the people there, they don't know the challenges, they don't know the history, they don't understand what that's like. And that's not to say that you have to be from a particular city to work in a particular city, but it is definitely helpful. Right, so we did that, and then we and we 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 really invested heavily in that. The the other component at the same time was we stood up a whole new section within the police department, and with a captain overseeing it, two lieutenants, uh, I want to say three, three sergeants, and then like thirty cops, and their whole their whole purpose is exactly what what Nishant was talking about is basically trust building. Right. As that's what we would call it. That's kind of the, the phrase that we have that we use is trust building. So um, these officers are uh, are going into neighborhoods that have been identified as having some of the most, you know, traditionally having some of the most challenges and going in there and getting to know the people, not just going to respond to a 911 call, but getting to know who lives there, who like actually lives there. Right. Because what we also know, kind of like Nishant was saying, how, you know, they only respond to three percent of the the beats or whatever. For us, we know that we only deal with about two to three percent of our population, right? Stockton's a big city, but we actually only deal with a very, very, very small percentage of the community in terms of the numbers. So what that means is it's a very small percentage of the people that are causing huge problems. So if you dissect that one step further, it means that everybody else there is probably just a normal person, right? So why would we not build relationships with those other normal people that happen to live in troubled areas and work in partnership with those folks. So that's precisely what we've done. So what that looks like, you know, from a, a practical perspective is a lot like Nishant's talking about, you know, we, it, it all started with kind of like the copy with the cops when they realized like, uh, nobody's going to go to copy with the cops. If you don't trust the police, you're not going to that, right? We have to go to you and say, Hey, what are the problems in your neighborhood that you see and how can we work together to address those problems? And how would you like us to address that? Right. And here's some ideas that that we have. Here's some ideas that you have. And how can we collaboratively uh, take this on? So um, and then it's grown from there as far as, you know, doing all all sorts of different programs. I mean, I, I could just go on and on and on and on about the, the trust building. It's actually gotten to a point with us where uh, we have what we call trust building workshops. So some of the people that live in these neighborhoods that we have developed very, very strong, good relationships with some of whom are actually moms of young men that our officers have shot and killed, right? They come in and we, we have what we call trust building workshops where they talk, the moms talk about their boys and to talk about what gang life is like and what that culture is like and why maybe their sons got involved in that, right? And our officers go and they talk about the, you know, and so mom will talk about how scary it is, right? Like how scary it is to live in this neighborhood or how scary it is to know that, hey, my son doesn't have any you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of options. It doesn't have the same opportunities that other kids in different areas have. And so then the officers will talk about, well, here's some of my fears, right? And, and those are extremely challenging, uh, you know, um, environments to have those discussions in. Or not environments, but those are extremely trying conversations in general. But we have found that they are, number one, super critical. And number two, they are very, very, very generative. And even if we don't necessarily all agree, we at least build more trust. Because if nothing else, at the end of it all, we recognize we're all people. Like, that's it. Like, I have, a, I have kind of a weird job that, you know, like I'm not a banker or a farmer or whatever. And, you know, but I am still, number one in my life, number one, I'm a dad and I'm a husband. 
and, and I worry about my kids just like everybody else. And I want the best for my kids, right? And I work hard for them. And for most people, that's still the case, right? And I got to worry about, hey, I got to pay my bills. I got to do, you know, all the regular stuff of life. And so once we can start seeing each other as just people and not, oh, that's the police or that's the person that lives in this neighborhood or that neighborhood, I would argue that's one of the first steps to get into exactly what your question is around, hey, how do you, how do you have somebody from outside the area come and police this area they're not familiar with? Is that, that would be one of the first steps in my mind. Definitely, uh, definitely agree with everything that you said. I just feel like, like, it's tough to see, man, because obviously I, I agree. You don't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be from a neighborhood to be able to police it. You should be able to adapt. I think all of us, especially because we're all, you know, I, I played basketball with all these people. Our brand was around us like 24 seven. She was, uh, she was on the women's basketball team, like doing the, uh, you know, doing the preliminary stuff as well. So she was around. So for all of us, we've always been able to adapt to each other and adapt to different situations. That's what I love about my friendship with my guys and my girl. But I feel like a lot of people can't do that. So now you have these situations where, again, they're not from a, a specific demographic or I'll use the example, like when I was at Enterprise and I was working, when, when certain people come in and they have a debit card and they have out of state driver's license, different things like that. You start to put certain people in a certain category in a box, right? Same thing with what I do now. I do installs. So depending on the address that I get first thing in the morning, I'm already having a premeditated notion of, oh, this is going to be a good job. I'm going to make a lot of money. Or, oh, it's in the hood. Like it's right up the street from my grandma's house. It's probably going to be a boo boo job. You know what I mean? That's just realistically what I'm thinking or what people think in general. And I feel like I'm pretty sure that's the same thing that happens in a police department. They're like, okay, like Nishant said, they get a call and they get a certain address and it's like, dog, I've been over that address five times this week. I already know what it's going to be. Another domestic violence call, whatever the case may be. But it just sucks to me. Like just me personally, the way I feel about it is it just hurts my heart to see when these videos come out, and I really feel like the media is tailored to putting these videos out, especially of black people, because you don't see it happening with other races. You don't see it happen. And I, I don't I don't agree that I don't think that it doesn't happen to other races, because obviously it does. It happens to everybody. Black, white, Latino, it doesn't matter. But it's always being recorded like black people. And the black the ones with black people are at a high. It's like Super, you think about, you can name them, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, you, uh, um, Breonna Taylor, who's the police officers have still haven't been, you know, rep reprehended for it. Uh, George Floyd. And then we just had one, I don't know if it's last night or the night before, but it it's still going on. And these are big ones, like they're blatant and you can see it on camera, them getting shot and killed. You can see it on camera, George Floyd, the dude's on his neck for eight minutes in 46 seconds. It's heartbreaking to see that stuff. So I can only imagine for you guys as cop at Hearst because that's in your in your niche, right? If Dez did something that was like super stupid when we were in college, it obviously it would affect Dez, but then it's like, bro, like I'm hurting because now Dez just messed up and now it reflects on all of us and we don't want that. You know what I mean? I want the best for my brother, but at the same time, now what you did created a bad image for everybody. And I feel like you guys have to deal with that. How do you guys deal with that? Because now, people, just like how people, the police have preconceived notions about these neighborhoods and these cities and different things like that. Now we have preconceived notions about you, Brad, you, Nishant. So how do you guys go about your everyday life as a detective, as a as an officer in general, just knowing that people feel that way about you and when you've done nothing? So... <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's it's not a good feeling. I'm gonna just start off with that, like knowing that. Um, I can say, I told you know I can say this. Uh, so my proudest moment as a police officer was when I graduated the academy. Uh, you just had this really good feeling. I was like, okay, I'm getting ready to go out there. I'm gonna go serve. I'm gonna go um, just 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 be. In my mind, I thought I'm gonna be that cop that nobody's ever been able to be. I'm gonna go ahead and. I'm going to be able to bridge gaps in some of these challenged neighborhoods. Um, but the last couple of weeks, 
been probably not probably definitely my um, most unproud moments as a police officer. Um, you know, just reading all the social media, hearing the social media, and like my kids, the age that they're at, right, fourteen and ten. Um, you can't help but think, man, I, they have access to all these social media platforms, and just wonder, like, are they seeing all that? Are they trying to, you know, measure it up with is dad like that? And I mean. So I shared that with my wife. My wife's like, first of all, our kids aren't stupid. They know what you're about. They know what what you stand for. They know what you're what you're up. You know how how you move and how you've consistently moved for how, however many decades in this game. Um, but yeah, I mean, people are gonna people have a right to be upset with police because we are the we are the first. So it's and I don't gotta tell you all this. So I'm just I'm just stating what we already know but historically you know it um the government has not been fair to black people um that's just that's that's that we have to be very comfortable saying that um i think this country is built on the backs of black people and that's just that's that's real talk and so until people can get comfortable recognizing and saying that um we can't get we have to we have to acknowledge that before we um, are going to make steps forward and so police represent that first layer of government because we have the uniform on, we, we, we get paid by the government. It's just, we are the arm of the government. So I think naturally people are gonna feel a certain way. So it didn't feel good. To, like when I hear everybody say, you know, F the police, F-O-P-D, kill cops, and just seeing cops getting shot at, like just like legit innocent cops getting shot. I was, in of the police station in my car on the phone with one of my deputy chiefs and he's like talking i had the phone on speaker because i was actually eating with my other hand so i had the phone on speaker on my on my on my knee and this car drives by and lets loose and th thank god they missed i was like and he's yelling he's like, are you getting shot i was like man I, I think they just they just shot at us right and so you know they ended up getting caught and they they had the gun and everything but i understand you know the more I think about it, they're probably shooting up in the air to, to, to spark fear. And, and that's people letting up, lashing out. I think people have a right to be upset. I absolutely think people have a right to be upset. It doesn't feel good that um, I would be uh, under that umbrella. Um, just that's the human side of me. But I understand what my patch represents, what my star represents, what's different on my uniform. And every police officer has this one unique thing on their uniform that is there opportunity to really not get painted by that broad brush and that's your nameplate right that's the one thing that's different and so when you personalize your your relationships with people in the community and they get to know oh oh that's well they call me yoshi my last name is joshi but people people know me in the neighborhoods as yoshi and I, I i'm very comfortable and confident that people in the neighborhood know that I'm, I'm 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 fair and that i don't i'm not i'm not with none of that nonsense and so i think it's just one relationship at a time it's you know, when I was when I was standing on that skirmish line and demonstrators like take a knee, take a knee. I was like, OK, I'll take a knee. And I took a knee. I was the only one who took a knee. And so because I wanted to just say, I, I hear you, I see you. And 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 by taking a knee, I'm not dishonoring anyone. I'm actually saying like, you know, in the military, Brad can probably speak a lot better about this. In the military, when you take a knee, you're honoring people that have that have that have died. And so um, I just think. To answer your question, how do I deal with that? It doesn't feel good at first, but I, I, I know that if I take my time in trying to introduce myself to people, being on this Zoom call with people I've never met before, um, that, that's an opportunity to at least um, maybe not change how, how people feel about the Oakland Police Department, but definitely give some type of hope. I hope that you will say, all right, they got somebody who's willing to come to the table and talk. Brad, I'll turn it to you. So, I mean, I got two, two things, I guess. So to get your original, or the first point you made, Darnell, around having the idea of like, when you're gonna go to a job, and yeah, it's gonna be a good one, it's not gonna be a good one, whatever. 100%, you, you nailed it. It's 100% accurate for police officers going into a particular neighborhood. And, and it's even, take it a step further, you know, the reality is, Police officers, even in a big city like Stockton, they go to the same address over and over and over and deal with literally the same family over and over and over. And so they already have an idea, oh man, you know, so-and-so has been, you know, doing this or that or the other, and that's going to go bad, right? So what we, what we have done um, is we 
we've invested very heavily in implicit bias training. So what we're talking about is implicit bias, right? Having an idea about what's going to happen before you ever show up just based on a few past experiences. And every human, a science, if you research this, and I've done a ton of research around it, I had to my, my last job, or my last assignment within the department, um, uh, every human being falls victim to implicit bias because that is, that, that's how we are wired. And implicit bias isn't necessarily wrong. What's wrong is to act on it, right? And so that is the, that's what we're trying to drive home to our officers is, hey, implicit bias, having an idea about what's going to happen when you go to a particular house, that might keep you alive because you might know, oh man, you know, this is, you know, this is John's house. He's on parole for trying to kill a cop. And every time he comes here, you know, he, he's talking about wanting to kill us. Maybe today's the day, right? However, you can't just show up with your gun out of your holster already, right? So have that in the back of your mind, but do not act on it. Do not act on it until the, the, the situation is appropriate for you to act and just recognize that. And so part of it, again, to, to the point and to your question is, is, you know, we call it training, but really educating our officers to a very deep level around what does this mean? And what are these feelings I'm feeling? And what are these thoughts I'm having? And how do I prevent myself from being the next big news story? And how do I prevent the person that I'm, I'm going to en engage with from, you know, having some terrible experiences they should have never happened, right? So that's the first piece. That's how I would answer that. The second piece, as far as what's going on around here, you know, I, I, I mean, I could go on, on about this as well, and I won't, but to, to sum it up briefly, you know, there's no, there's nobody on planet earth that's more important to me than my kids, right? And my four-year-old, man, this little boy, he adores me like you can't imagine. And I got to soak it up because my 17-year-old, he wants nothing to do with me, right? Like as most 17-year-old, almost 18-year-old men, they don't want nothing to do with their dad right now, right? But my baby boy, everything is about police. He wants to be a police officer so bad. He sees me, normally I, I wear what I'm wearing today. I wear like a you know, tie or whatever. And he calls it my, my boss outfit. And he has little clothes where he'll go put on his tie and he'll be like, daddy, I'm gonna be the boss. I'm gonna be the, the, the police boss today too. I'm gonna go to my meetings and I'm gonna make sure my police officers do it. Because my wife and I talk about it you know, nonstop. And, and, and so the point of it is, I'm like, man, I'm so thankful he doesn't know what's going on in the world and how police officers are being looked at because my son is so proud of me. And, and quite frankly, it, it breaks my heart that, you know, my wife and I had this discussion the other night about how I, I absolutely, where we are today, I, my kids are good kids. They're really good kids. They're good people. But I don't want them to be police officers because I don't want them to be subjected to what is occurring in our country right and and yeah it's a tough time I mean, bottom line right like i think that's kind of the easiest way to encapsulate my my feelings around all that and at the same time i guess i also recognize that i have an opportunity just like nishant said to i'm not going to change stockton right like i, I can't go out and change four hundred thousand people on my own and and our department is big we got you know we have a thousand full-time employees and that police department will never be called the Burrell Police Department. But I do, I am in control of a certain part of the police department and I have influence over a certain part of the community, of, of the community and those that, that interact with our department. And to that, I take super seriously and ensuring that, just like Nishant said, where people know him as, as Yoshi, that they know, you know what, like that dude is like, I'm gonna take a hard line on certain things, but I'll also do everything I can to take care of you. I'll be the first person to advocate for you if you did the right thing, and I'll be the first person to hold you accountable if you did the wrong thing. And that's not just for my officers, that's also for people in the community, bottom line. Um, okay, I, gotta, I guess I'll, I'll go a question that I have. Um, I think I talked to G about this before and Gaddy. I guess uh, my question is like, what is the, like your guys' protocol if um, like when you're out on duty and if you feel like the officer, your partner or whoever responds to a call and you feel like, okay, for lack of better words, you're, he's doing too much or he's, he, okay, he's taking it too far. Like, I guess my question is like, what is the protocol can you, are you allowed to check him? Like, are you allowed to like tell him to calm down or bring it down or whatnot? Like what is, like what is the protocol around that? Because we see 
the things that happen and we see, and then again, when we see, we see other police officers, either they're cool, whether they're cool with it or not, but they're just allowing it to go on. And so I guess just to answer that question, just what is that protocol? Is it different from the department or is it as a whole? Yes, I'll, I'll jump on that. Okay, ahead, Brad. Go ahead, Brad. Yes, yeah, so I would say at least. So one thing I think that we should have mentioned from the beginning, because I actually I just had a conversation with somebody the other day that did not realize this. So and maybe you guys all know this. I don't know, but it, it occurred to me that it's a common theme that or a common thought that people don't recognize is that every single police department across America is different, right? And every single police department is run by one person within that department. So even though, like you know. In the Bay Area, there's how many little cities that all bump up next to each other. Their training could be all different. Their policies could be all different. The culture could be all different, so on and so forth, right? So what I can speak to is what's happening in Stockton. And similarly, what Nishant can speak to is what's happening in Oakland. Um, because, uh, and I would say that, that one of the gaps that exists in law enforcement today is that there isn't some sort of national standardized system. Um, for that oversees police officers and, and, and training and, and standards in general. I mean, California, there is, but nationally, there is not. So uh, to the point, your question for us, we have a policy that says you, you have a responsibility, you have a duty to intervene and, and prevent somebody from breaking a policy or breaking a law. And if you see a policy or law being broken by another officer, you have a duty and responsibility to to report it, and if you don't, then you're going to be on the hook just the same. Does that does that answer your question, Des? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like, I mean, it was a very basic question. I just was I've talked to a few people about it, but I didn't know if it was a based on each department, like you said, or if it was just you know overall this is universal for the police department. So yeah, that so, answers it. Go ahead. So same, same, yeah, it's just same thing in Oakland. We got the same policy that you have you have to intervene, and if you don't intervene, you're held accountable equally. Um, but um, you know, and Bragg could probably uh, relate to this as well. What happens though? Why does why does stuff like why does stuff like Minneapolis happen? Right? You got four police officers there, and nobody said, "Hey, man, what are you doing?" Right? Why does that happen? What happens is, remember, I talked about this is like a social like you're in a group setting and 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 sometimes i think in the interest of trying to be um try, trying to be and i'm not saying this is right i'm saying this is wrong but i'm trying to put meaning on why this occurs i think sometimes cops are like well i don't i don't want to be that guy right and so what a good supervisor has to do is be able so we're required our supervisors are required to do random audits of the officers body worn cameras so not just when they get a complaint but just random, let's see what they, how they did on this call. And they watch it like it's a movie and they're supposed to pick it apart. I mean, you guys, you guys play sports, right? And so almost like how you watch a video, same thing. The sergeant is supposed to watch the video and say, oh man, I, you, 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 let, you know, they're supposed to pick up on things that I didn't see you step up right here, man. You saw, you saw Nishant kind of, you know, doing a little bit too much. Why didn't, why didn't you step up and like pull him back? He got caught up in the moment that could have escalated to something else. So it's, it's, having another set of, a layer of review that has the opportunity to look at what what the officers are doing and then teaching them not just saying man you're supposed to jump in in the middle of that and say stop no it's really like also showing somebody how do you do that right and so it's little subtle things like man next time just put your hand on the shoulder and be like hey i got this man i'm once you go hey do, do me a favor go back there and go, go grab some uh go grab me some um some paperwork right and then just like kind of common things down. So I think it's really, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a process always going. You have, to, it's a living process that you have to consistently be analyzing and saying, we got to get better because if you don't and you just think, okay, the rules are the rules and that's what they do. Um, you, you'll, you'll miss the opportunity of the, of, the, of the human element coming in where you're going to, humans are going to do human things. And that's just like, be quiet or like not try to stay, you know, not try to intervene. It's, it's just, you, they need those reminders of, how do you do these types of things? So, it's the one thing that that I also offer just just for context, I guess. 
so you guys are aware. So probably through the course of this conversation and, and multi, you know, the conversations that will happen in the future with this group is you'll, you'll notice that uh, our policies are very similar to Oakland's. That's because our two departments have worked together uh, in, in a very close partnership for years and years and years because we have very similar challenges. We have similar communities. And, and I would argue uh, that to some degree we have figured out what works right and why. And we've also figured out what doesn't work and, and why. And so um, when you hear us saying, oh yeah, we do this. And you know, the other person says, yeah, we do that too. Uh, that 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 might be an anomaly when it comes to law enforcement in general. Um, you know, as far as like, well, if the, if Stockton and Oakland do this, then why doesn't Minneapolis do that, or why why doesn't Atlanta or wherever it is, right? So just recognize that that small nuance, um, and uh, and you know, just just kind of know that's in play. Appreciate that. Um, Gaddy, Bryn, oh, yeah. UCR, or Scott, I see Scott's back. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for being on the call too. Uh, I didn't know if I could have said that before, but um, yeah, thank you guys for being on this call because it's very informative um, and I'm taking a lot in just as far as like all the information, um, learning all the stuff. And then also I'm Abdul, me and Dez, Went to school together at Washington, played hoop together, and then just we've been really close friends ever since. Um, but one of my questions was, and it's kind of a general question, and I want to make sure that I kind of say it right, but I think the general consensus is that, like, for the whole, for everything to get better, just as far as like racism and um, racism and just like, being able to deal with cops, being an African American, and just going about that, um, it's probably going to be like way in the future, you know, as far as like it getting a lot better to where we want it to be. But I do want to know, like, with everything going on and with trying to make change, like, where where do you got? And I want to hear you guys' opinion, just as far as like where do we go from here, you know? And I'm in that. I know you guys can only can control so much as far as like, you know, you guys are probably doing your due diligence at Stockton PD and in Oakland, but how do we get that on a countrywide scale? How do we get that to where it's like across all of the U S um, and, and get it to where, you know what I'm saying? Like we can get better so that it's better for our kids or our kids, kids and head in that right direction. Um, because I mean, I don't know really how to word it, but like, I don't want to just be like, okay, I know I'm good if I come to Stockton and I know I'm good if I go to Oakland or in Washington, but I know if I go to Alabama or Mississippi, it's not so great. You know what I'm saying? And, and I know like you only can control so much. Like I understand that part. I'm just saying like, how do, what's your opinion about how do we go about this as a country to get to that point to where it's like, as a country, we are better as far as, you know what I mean? Handling all these situations. Um, other, poli other police officers can handle those situations better. Um, just so that, you know, like this isn't, this isn't a thing anymore. Like, so that this part of history is not repeating itself. Yes, yeah, so I would love to take on that question, Ashant, on the front end, if you don't mind. Um, because this is, uh, this has been a, a present thought for me recently. And I was thinking about my responsibility in, in continuing the conversation internally, but also to your point exactly, how do we spread that, right? And so I was listening to uh, a podcast this morning that I listen to every morning and it, and it spurred a thought for me around, there's a saying in the military, right? That, um, hey, I'm on a call, bud. Um, um, that uh, like particularly in Baghdad, right? We'll bring it back to my experience in Baghdad. Like in Baghdad, we're going and raiding some of the, the we're in the literally the worst neighborhoods on planet Earth. Right. And there are literally terrorists that want to, you know, that want to blow us up. And so we would go in with a small group of soldiers and, you know, raid a house or take over a particular neighborhood because we knew they're building bombs or whatever it is. And so what, you know, as a leader, then we would tell our guys, find work, find work. Don't get comfortable because your angle is covered or your corner of the house is covered or you got your, your detainee, you got him covered. Find more work. Once your job is done, find more work. And so 
I, I was listening to this podcast this morning and it reminded me of that little saying of find work. And so I, I think uh, to the question and to the point, I think that's one of the messages I'm going to put out to not just the, the detectives that work for me, but also my family and friends that every one of us has a responsibility to find work in this realm, right? And, and to talk about, I would argue that everybody on this call has a responsibility, not just, I mean, it is truly a responsibility and a serious responsibility to go into other circles outside of the people that are on this call and have conversations with, you know what, hey, I want to tell you about this or this or this, because it might inspire somebody else to have a similar conversation and a similar conversation. Um, you know, I think, I, I don't know if Des shared this, I think maybe one of the reasons that he reached out to me is to, to invite me to this call, which I, I, I can't tell you all how much I appreciate it, is because, you know, as you can imagine, my friends on, on social media, a lot of them are cops, right? And I kept seeing all this stuff about, hey, if you're anti-police, unfriend me, right? And so I put up this big post basically saying, hey, you know, I see all you saying, if you're anti-police, unfriend me. I say, if you're anti-police, talk to me. And then I went into that about, hey, if you're anti-police, talk to me. And, and that, so that, that talk to me and find work, those are the two things I think we all have to do. And it starts exactly like this, right? You look back at history, you look back at the Vietnam War and how things changed in the 60s in, in, in great ways through truly grassroots efforts, right? And I think in many ways, we're back in that same place where it takes conversations like this to, to inspire and encourage other conversations to take place like this in every corner of the country. And we all have a responsibility to encourage that and inspire that and, and to uh, make people aware of the importance of it. Otherwise, you're right. We're doomed to, to, to be back at square one soon. Right on, Brad. Hey, I meant to tell you also, I did see that on LinkedIn when you posted, uh, you know, I think it was Facebook or LinkedIn, one of the two. I saw that. I appreciated that. That actually rung true to me. So I think I, I echo what you're saying. Um, so to answer your question, how do we get the, so, cause this is important to me as well. How do we keep this forward momentum going? Right. And so, um, I think that there's so many layers to this. Um, I think police are one component, but I think that, um, as I said earlier, there's so many other systems, uh, in a country that have marginalized and oppressed, uh, particularly black people, uh, and also brown people. But I think, I think, um, you know, because it was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on black people because I think that it's different with, with black people. It was, it was no other group has experienced what black people have experienced in, in, in the history of America. So that's just real talk. Um, but I think we have to, so there's other layers. There's like other basic, and Desmond and, and uh, remember when we were at um, St. Mary's, they talked about like the basic needs of people have to be met in order for people to progress to the next level, right? So housing, safety, food, those are the things that like, those are other layers that, that also have to be focused on. And so I think that's how you, how you, um, how you holistically approach um, um, disparities in, in America. Now, how's, but this conversation right now is about police. I think we got to stay as a, um, as a learning institution we can't just stop at like once you go through the academy you go through field for service we have to constantly be our biggest crit critics but um in collaboration with the people that are most um impacted uh or uh, marginalized through through police enforcement and so um that that takes what brad is talking about that's having the regular engagements, um, having like the doors wide open. It shouldn't be that like once a month that people from the community are having the opportunity to, to speak with police. I think it should be a regular, uh, um, a regular process. And that, what does that regular look like? Maybe it's not coming to the police station, but it's, it could be definitely when police arrive on calls for service and try to provide service that questions like, Hey, how, how are we doing? How can we do better? I was thinking the other day, um, I, I had my, my, my Wi-Fi upgraded by, by Comcast. And I remember the, the Comcast guy that came here, 
and he was so focused on trying to get me the best service. And when you take the, um, the survey on me, can you give me a five or give me a six? I'll give you a six. But yeah, you got it. So his focus was that. It was like making sure that I walked away feeling like, man, they, they, they were trying to get to me. And then I get surveyed, like text messages, like, hey, how do you do? And then, you know, I uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to, to, to provide service at your house. So it has to be like this consistent um, feedback loop of, uh, of performance, but it's led by the community, not, not dictated by, by police. And so um, I think really just got, we have to stay as a um, consistently learning uh, environment. Right? That's just, we just have to be like that. We just can't stop at, at, at one piece of training and then, and then keep it moving. We just have to be um, critical and, and constantly trying to learn. And they're really just centering, centering the, um, the interests of people that are marginalized. Because like I said earlier, we are the, um, we are the representation of the government arm. And so we have to, we have to consistently center uh, those that have been historically marginalized and, and make, making sure that service surrounds, or surrounds that uh, in mind. Um, so we'll take a, we'll take a few more questions because you know how black people are about that money. Duty or myself don't want to pay for that subscription. So <laughs> we'll keep the, <laughs> we'll keep the... <laughs> Hey, I can't, I, 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 so look, next time, if you guys want to keep this going next time, just, you know, I set, we can use my, my department, uh, Zoom account okay. and like this. Uh, so. Okay. Um, so next question, uh, we'll do, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to wrap them up. Yeah, and, uh, just let me know. Let's do for sure. Let's do Bryn. Um, and then I know, uh, G and Scott have a couple more things. So, uh, after those three go, then we'll, we'll let duty close it. Well, Ab Abdul, I'm sorry uh, for the, for the newcomers. We'll let Abdul close it out. I'll just be quick. Um, just wanted to say thank you guys for, um, taking the time to share your experiences with us. Um, just so you guys know me, my name's Bryn. I've known these men for 10 years plus now. Um, so I'm just thankful for each and every one of them in my life. Um, and so some of the things that you guys have said, I have definitely learned a lot from. Um, one of the things that one of my fellow friends told me is that you guys get 720 hours to learn how to be a cop. Um, I just wanted to clarify, is that what you are talking about? Each department gets to choose how that looks. Um, are there some guidelines that you guys have to follow? And then also, Brad, one of the things you mentioned on your trust building, um, how successful has it been? And is there a way for each? So I know that you said Stockton and Oakland have come together and um, shared some ideas. Is there ways for you guys to do that more with other departments, maybe outside of California, or is that kind of a, I'm not stepping on somebody's feet type of deal, or how does that look if it's different? So Nishant, maybe you want to take on the first part of the question. I'll take the second since you're in training and I can definitely speak to the trust building part. Okay, so I can kind of talk. So in the academy, so, so the state of California, they, uh, the, their minimum standard is about 720 hours to su successfully, you have to, you get 720 hours of training and that, that includes a testing to receive a post certificate that makes you, that allows you to be a police officer in the state of California. In Oakland, um, I add an additional 500 hours of training. So it's, it's right around 1200 hours of training. Um, the academy gets extended. We're, we're right around seven months of the of academy time that we have. Uh, we even, I included a couple different blocks of instruction. As I just got up to training uh, in July of last year. And one of the things I included was a 40-hour um, course on equity. Um, and so it's a, a race and equity course that I've added. So that's additional 40 hours. There's additional hours on patrol procedures, additional hours on community policing. So we really expand out use of force. Uh, lots of training, not so that they get good at using use of using force. It's because I want them to focus on their decision points, right? How do you how do you decide when and where to, to use force? The, again, the minimum standard is 720. We're up to 1,200 hours. 
Um, and I think Stockton, similarly, the academies uh, uh, that they have, they have, they're much, much higher than the minimum standard. And they, their focus is a lot on community policing, decision making around force, engaging in vehicle pursuits, risk management, things like that. So that's the first piece. And then every 18 months, I'm sorry, every two years, the state requires that you re do refresher training. So it's 40 hours additional. Um, in Oakland, uh, we do it every year. Uh, so we, we double that. So because we want, you know, we realize that these are perishable skills that you can you can lose as you go on. And then there was a second piece to that. I think that you were asking about how do you standardize this type of training um, throughout, th you know, throughout the industry. Well, very cool news that's working. So there's a guy by the name of Ron Davis. Um, he was a captain at the Oakland Police Department, went to East Palo Alto, became the chief there. And then after that, he went and he was working uh, under Obama uh, in the cops office, which is like the, for the basically making policy grant funding for all police efforts uh, throughout the country. So he was he would have he had FaceTime with President Obama on a regular basis. He was part of his his task force. He wrote what was called the 21st Century uh, uh, Policing Task Force Report on um, Task Force Report on Policing. Um, if you get a chance, look it up. What he's what to bring him back to California, and he's going to do the same thing for the entire state of California because the goal is to standardize um, how agencies do do policing across the board. I know the question earlier was like, well, I might be okay in Oakland, I might be okay in Stockton, but I don't know if I'm be okay in Alabama. And so I think that's that's kind of I mean, so at least in the state of California. Um, the, they're, we're looking to standardize things, but that's a work in progress. So, um, yeah, I think I hope that answered your question. Uh, is it Bree or Bryn? Uh, Bryn I'm sorry. Um, and then Brad, I'll let you go to the trust piece. Yeah. So Bryn, so just just a uh, one, I guess to support what Nishan is saying, it's the same thing for us. Yes, the state standard is 720 hours, but for Stockton, also like Oakland, we we require hundreds of more hours um, regardless of what academy you go to our own academy is about 1100 hours and then even if you go to uh you know one of these i actually don't even know of an academy that we we don't use any academies that are only 720 hours because we only use a handful of them um but in any case we uh, we also require about a little more than a month of in-house training after you become you know service your basic service before you ever even hit the street and then there's another six months and this is full time right so that's what 160 hours and then another six months which is what another more than thousand hours of training every single day um with a senior officer um and, and that's minimum it could go that six month period could go out to you know seven eight nine months so what we're looking at is more than a year full time uh, before you're a fully certified solo beat officer for us. So for us, we're, we're well north of 2,000 hours of training before you're a, a solo beat officer for us. Um, and, and then to your other question around, you know, the success that we have experienced with the trust building. So, you know, of course, huge successes are not very well publicized in the media. However, in law enforcement circles, of course, they are well shared because we want to recreate success, right? You know, reason to, to reinvent the wheel if it's working well in one place, maybe we can do the same thing in another. So um, to, to, to that end, uh, the, the federal government came in to Stockton because they heard that, about what we were doing and they developed what's called the National Initiative on Trust Building, right? And so there were five pilot sites in America, five cities that were, um, you know, the, the federal government wanted to come in, they took, uh, climate surveys in the city um, and basically asked, they were not police officers that did this, they were people that, uh, most of them were students, most of them were college students that were just going door to door, taking, you know, doing questionnaire type things and, and figuring out what is the trust like in this community? And then we, you know, we did all this various trust building and they came back months later to determine, hey, it, what we're saying, we say it's effective, is it really effective, right? And so there's this big national study around it the federal government determined, yeah, what we're doing is right. And the federal government released this huge report around what we are doing. We have actually become the national model for trust building in our community. Um, I would argue uh, that, you know, it's not by mistake or not by accident that the demonstrations that we have had have been incredibly peaceful. 
in Stockton, right? Despite the fact that um, people are very angry and people want to be heard and for, for all the right reasons, right? Yet we have not necessarily, we haven't had looting and acts of violence like other cities have experienced. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, those cities have it all wrong. What I'm saying is, you know, some of it, quite honestly, is, is luck, I guess, or, or unluck. But also, I, I would say that there is a great deal uh, to kind of lay that foundation on the front end before a crisis occurs in your community, right? Because it, it is, at the end of the day, it is all based on that trust. So again, Brent, to your, to your question specifically, yes, uh, there is a, a report that has been shared nationally with other law enforcement agencies around what we're specifically doing in California. And, and in fact, the captain who was kind of the lead on developing this program for us. He has been hired by the state of California uh, by POST. So the Commission on POST, which is an acronym for Peace Officer Standards and Training. That's the state organization that oversees all law enforcement agencies in California. They've hired our guy as a consultant to develop curriculum for all police departments in California around trust building. So hopefully that answers your question. It absolutely does. Uh it sounds amazing. Um, I definitely want to, I don't, you could probably give Des more info on how to find it if it's not just like easily, like easy to Google. Um, but I don't know if it's the most ideal thing as a police officer, but as a civilian, it sounds like standardizing policing could be very beneficial. I would argue it is the right thing to do because okay. I don't want to, you know, yeah, I would absolutely argue you're you're hundred percent on the money. It, standardizing is what should occur and what needs to occur quite quite clearly. Thank you. Hey, before we move to Garrett or Scott, let's not overlook the fact that Brian was about to say Google. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was thinking the same exact thing and I was like that might be that might be a word. And <laughs> you know what? It probably isn't, but however, you guys always get up about something. <laughs> Sorry, when the phone cut out, I was like, you know what, Gaddy, you forgot to pay the phone bill again. <laughs> uh, too shy, too shy, too shy. <laughs> Maybe I should have done that. All right, last, last couple, and then. Don't everybody talk at once. I think, isn't, isn't it G mm -hmm. or Scott? It's G, it's G or Scott, Scott, right? Well. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I missed some, so I don't want to add something that may have already been answered, especially since our time is limited, clearly. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. So no G. I, I just was wondering a, li if, a little bit into what, what does the trust building consist of? I'm just curious to know. What, how, how, does it, how do you guys go about even building that trust or what does that program look like? Right, if so. If you did, then a quick overview. No, I did, I did, but I'll, I'll, I'll recap it, you know, uh, kind of succinctly. And, and, and for, as far as the, the call goes, I mean, yeah, I think we all have, you know, stuff to do tonight, but for me at least, I'm happy to participate in more calls because I'm sure after this conversation is over, more thoughts are gonna emerge and more questions. So don't hesitate, you know, Des can hit me up anytime and I'm, I'm happy to participate again in the future with additional questions. But, but your question, Scott, so uh, very long story short, what we did several years ago um, was we invested heavily in, in recruiting and hiring locally, right? Like within the city of Stockton, because we know that we need people to, uh, you know, to, 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 to be familiar with the city that they're gonna be policing. That's step one. The other step two is having officers that are wearing police uniforms, that our police officers go into the communities where, you know, neighborhoods that are very troubled and do things that are not what you think of a typical police officer doing, right? And that is simply building relationships, right? And asking the people there, figuring out who are the actual community leaders in that area? Is it a teacher? Is it a coach? Is it a pastor? You know, we can all think of the people that in, in with the area where I grew up, who was super influential? Well, cops are pretty good at figuring out those things, particularly when it comes to, to like, say, for example, gangsters, right? Or, or people that are running, you know, pounds of dope. We figure out who's kind of the big fish. So we kind of shifted the, the thought process of our cops is, hey, don't focus on who's running a gang, but focus on who's running these neighborhoods in positive ways. Make relationships, build relationships with them and ask them 
hey, what are the problems here? I, don't, I, I should not come into your neighborhood. What is the problem that's happening here? And what do you think that we collectively can do to address that, right? And collaborate around that. And then we, that became, you know, very, very positive and very successful. So we took it a step further and we had uh, what we call trust building workshops where we'd hold these meetings, basically day long meetings that are usually 10 hour meetings offsite, usually at either at a library or church, or someplace that's not the police department and, or another government building. And we would have these people that, that we built relationships with and they would talk about their experience of living in a particular neighborhood. And they would talk about their experience of interacting with the police when it wasn't normally or very often, it wasn't positive, right? Um, some of the folks that, as I mentioned earlier, one of the folks that we have help, that's helped us so much in this is a mom whose son we shot and killed, our officer shot and killed. And she was, as you can imagine, when this whole thing first kicked off, she was extremely angry, right? And she was like, oh, you better believe I want a piece of that ass of the police department. I'll come in here and tell you what the problem is. And, and she did, right? But what we did was listen, right? And so um, at the end of it all, we recognized that we can disagree on certain things, but if we at least begin to see each other as people, that's step one. So that's what we have really tried to institutionalize and make sure that every single cop, no matter how long they've been on the job, no matter their rank, no matter their assignment, they understand that and they truly embody it. Thank you. What's going on? Um, yeah, I got, I guess I have one more, or I got a question. Um, uh, so, my question is like, do you guys think you are being asked to do too much? Like as far as like, I know there's like been examples where there's certain things where people will call the cops for stuff that may not need cops. Or uh, I think Darnell said something earlier about like uh, certain, I think he said something about community neighborhoods or some or like housing, how housing is important or certain things like that can, um, help stop problems before they start. I don't know if that's, um, and obviously there's like a, the controversial thing where everyone's saying like defund the police. I'd be curious like what, how you guys feel about that or if like you guys, if you may feel like, hey, like we should be doing certain things but we're being asked to do more or do you think you guys are doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing as far as, far as like the calls you get and things like that? I was like kind of, so, yeah, I got you. Uh, so well, me and my wife are just talking about this. So I think that, um, I, I think that, um, so ideally community policing, the idea and the concept of community policing was to have it so that police officers could be the ones that resolve all types of issues that happen in a particular neighborhood. What I have recently, as of recent, the last couple of weeks, as I've reflected on this, have come to realize, I don't think that an, a police academy is enough to properly equip a police officer with how to deal with, um, how to deal with like just multi-layered social issues. And so I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how other police officers feel about this, but I'm actually okay with, um, on calls where there's like, there's like, so this is how I envision it, right? If there's a call where, you know, a domestic type situation, right? Officers get there when it's safe. Um, I think that then at that point, it'd be nice to have another team of like social workers simply equipped with, I mean, they're Oh, I'm cutting that in and out. Oh, dang, can you guys hear me okay? I, I just got a text from Des saying that I'm cutting in and out. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, you, you are about, me. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm 
Because black oh, no. people, black people ain't the only one that don't pay their internet bill. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now, though? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know what? Maybe it might be. Yeah. Okay. How about now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what I was saying is, I'm I'm okay with us um, having like experts come in and resolve and and really carry can you guys hear me okay just let me know if i'm cutting it out just th somebody throw a thumbs thumbs down if, if it's okay if it's, if it starts going bad throw that thumbs down okay but i'm okay with um police coming in and and really being there to 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 make way for i guess the experts to come in and resolve multi-layered issues right and so so let's say for example you go to call for because cops are like limited in and what do they do? I mean, we have information as far as making referrals, but it would be, but those referrals delay the service that's going to come. So if there's a domestic type situation, the cops are like, hey, so if they're, they're looking for is there a vi act of violence that occurred because they don't want to leave and they hear that the it, things escalated. So really the resolution is either A, the person um, uh leaves and it doesn't escalate to some but if there's violence if there's anything that suggests violence that occurred cops are kind of limited in that step and they and they end up having to make an arrest but that doesn't really resolve the issue because now somebody's gone to jail the house is uh the family dynamic is upset and so i i, I don't and the, the problem can persist so i just think it would be nicer if if a police off, police officer can come in make sure that there's no danger and then having experts come in social workers come in to help try to help people work through their 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 issues or like if there's a neighborhood dispute my neighbor's playing the music too loud right i think if we part of community having like a community working together is that community members can have like an intermediary not police maybe not police in that instance if there's nothing nothing of high danger that's going on and so um i'm okay with us um allocating some of our budget towards uh, resolving issues that don't require um, a police officer. That's that's how I feel. So I will uh, I'll turn it over to Brad. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So we've had a lot of discussions. Our command staff has had a, a a great deal of kind of collective discussions, formally and informally, around this idea. Uh, just over the last couple of weeks, particularly since the this kind of defund the police, um, you know, movement, so to speak, has begun. And exactly like Nishant says, I think that. Everybody that, that, uh, that, that's been a part of these discussions, at least with me, we agree. We are being asked to do entirely too much. And, and one of two things would have to happen. Uh, either A, go to a model like Nishant is talking about or some sort of model like that. And there are, there are variations of ideas around that, but effectively what, what Nishant is talking about, right? Basically, we show up to make sure things are safe and then we pass it off to somebody else. Um, so not to, so I, don't, I just don't want to echo everything Nishant said, but effectively that. Or... The alternative would be that we completely revamp the truly the, the education that is required of a police officer. Um, and, and it would have to be something much more like a true college program, like at minimally, minimally, I would argue, at least like an AA degree. And quite, it should be something equivalent to more like a bachelor's degree. Because you cannot ask a police officer who I, I would say our department, and I know like Oakland, we have some of the best trained cops in California and across the nation. Nonetheless, they do not have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree, and yet they are being asked to go into homes and be a marriage and family therapist. They're going into homes and asked to be a mental health professional. They're being asked to, you know, so on and so forth. The, 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 you get it, you understand the theme. And they're being asked to wear too many hats without enough, uh, you know, an, enough opportunity to become specialists in these various areas. So either A, we have to really rethink what our academies look like and our education, our ongoing education, our ongoing training looks like, um, or we have to go to a model like Nishana is suggesting. And, and this latter piece that I'm discussing, quite frankly, I, I think that it's cost prohibitive. Um, and I, I, I don't, yeah, I think there's some challenges with the latter piece. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Those are the two, I think, that, I think uh, to encapsulate it, Simply, yes, I absolutely agree we're being asked to do too much. And I think that most cops would agree with the same. And if that means that we're asked to do less and we give up some of our funding, that's there's no there's that's a non-issue as far as I'm concerned.
Yeah. Um, definitely great answers, guys. We appreciate. I appreciate you guys for speaking for myself. I appreciate you guys just jumping on. Uh, one thing I was talking to Grandpa. We want to give you guys the opportunity to uh, to like. Uh, it's good that we got all this this first part of the conversation out. Maybe the next call that we can, you know, you guys can ask us questions, different things like that. Because I feel like we in the last hour or so we've gotten to know each other. We've gotten to know what Nashant and you, Brad, are about. Um, you kind of got an idea of the of the conversations that we've been having. If you haven't seen the videos that we put, like our, we've actually been recording the conversation and we put them up um, just so that people can, you know, get a grasp of us having that conversation. And I think it's big that we got you on the call. So shout out to uh, to Songs for uh, getting you on the call. And Songs is Dez, by the way. That's just <laughs> my nickname for him. Been calling them after years. Um, but Duty, if you wanna um, say something or anybody else. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I, I want to say the same thing. Thank you guys, Brad and Nishan, for being on the call. Um, and really, thank you, Dez, for – Dez had the idea uh, and asked me and then asked the group and was just like, man, like, I think it would be good. And, I mean, it's been great. This is a ton of information um, that, you know, we probably wouldn't be able to get from anybody else. And so, uh, yeah, Dez, appreciate you coming up with the idea. And also, too, like DG said, if anybody else has an idea of how we can further the conversation, just because I mean, I like I said before, like this helps me personally a lot, but also just to have an understanding of all this stuff going on and then just how to be better. Um, so if anybody else has an idea of like how we can like continue to further the conversation, um, you know, I'm all for that. But um, yeah, thank you, Des, for that. And Des probably should close us out now, seeing as he, he's the <laughs> one that. <laughs> has started all this so can, can i yeah. can i just say one thing though just to just to offer this up i do want to keep the conversation going and so let's 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 keep this going and and really i, I really like what was said earlier um i want to hear what you guys got to say what do you guys want out of what do you want how can how can i be of service right and and the other thing is you know i've i've told you know i don't know if you guys are local but feel free Come to the Oakland Police Department. Come take a look. See how we, how we, how we do business. And let's let's. This is an opportunity for like young minds um, to really shape how policing is going to be. I welcome you guys in any capacity to come to the Oakland Police Department. You guys want to become Oakland cops? I got you. I'm in, I'm in charge of training. And so, you know, I'm, I'm I'm we're looking for people that are that are forward thinkers. And definitely this whole group. There's forward thinkers in, in, on, on this call. And, and I just think that that's really what's going to, what's going to have this impact. You asked a question earlier. How do we, how do we get this, like, how do we capitalize on this forward momentum? And, my, and um, I know I make lots of reference to my wife, but she's hands down my better half, just like super smart, intelligent. She's St. Mary's also. She's doing the doctorate program at St. Mary's. Um, she's, she's wrapping that up as we speak, but she talks about this thing and her dissertation is on, um, is on police reform, um, and, and engagement with the black community. And one of the things that like, one of the ideas that she talks about is, is this thing called critical mass. You have to, you can't just have like one or two, like Brad kind of touched on this, right? Like having certain uh, people that work at the police department, because you're influential when you work at the police department, when you're on the inside, your voice is 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 very powerful when you're on the inside and i just think that we have to continue to hire um maybe not people direct that are from oakland but people that can understand what working in an urban environment is like and so um please i'm not like please if, if you if you have reservations about it, like well i don't know what that how does that look like man just send me a text or send desmond a text and be like actually desmond came out on a ride along uh in oakland one time and so send a text be like hey i want to i want to come see what the academy is like i want to see what you know, patrols, like, I want to go on a ride along, done, consider it done. And so, and if it's something that you're interested in, in whatever capacity, if it's, if it's being a police officer, being a technician, being um, part of a think tank, whatever that is, man, I welcome that. I, I would love to have, uh, you know, more of this in, in, that, in that capacity. And, and real quick, I, just the exact same thing goes for us as well. I, I'd love for you guys, you guys are in Stockton. I know we're not exactly a destination location, but it would be exciting for you to come on a ride along, if nothing else. And we would love to show you the inner workings of the police department. So anytime. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you again to both you guys and 
Um, we're making progress, but I don't know if I'm walking straight up into the police station. Uh, free? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, but seriously, it was a. Uh, it's for me personally. It's a, the call. I think was encouraging, especially at a time like this, to hear just the perspective and to get, um, like here in the training and how you guys were talking about um, the some of the trust training and just all the different topics that you guys talked about. It was encouraging for me. Um, just to, you know that all cops are not bad, but when you, you know, you continually see these things on, on the media and the television, it's encouraging, again, just to just to hear some positivity here about the good things that are going on that we know the media is not going to put out anyway. The, the good news doesn't sell. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you guys again for your time. And, uh, but yeah, I, I definitely want to continue the conversation. Thanks again. See you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm happy that it all worked out. I'm happy everybody was able to get on the call. Uh, I think it was very productive. I will say the funny thing about going on that ride along the shot is I'm in the back of the car driving around <laughs> Oakland. Like a <laughs> and I'm like, and I... <laughs> I'm in the back of the car, we drive past this school called Castlemont, and it's, it's in the hood. And it's a bunch of kids like outside, and they go, Oh, yeah, see, they got him. He in the back, he a snitch. I was like, Oh, I got a train kids out here. That is I'm funny. <laughs> informant. He's an right. informant. <laughs> that is funny because I wanted to say that. He's a paid informant. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't know. I, you know what I'm saying? But that's good because hopefully that. The watch, watch what you say, DG. Watch what you say. Right. <laughs> hopefully this conversation brings us, you know, to a place where we can be open like this because this is what it, For sure. what it's been about since the beginning is being open. So I was yeah. going to make a joke like that. but <laughs> Bruh, It's all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the right, it was cool. It's one hundred percent all good. There's, there's nobody that makes more jokes than cops about cops. Okay, okay. so it's all good. <laughs> nah, it was uh, nah for sure. When I, that was like the we're driving the back. I was just like, uh, so he said it. I was just like, yo, I'm, I'd be out here. Like, I train kids out here. I hoop out here. <laughs> I was like, it, it, might, it might be bad. I might have, but overall, it was a cool experience just to see, like, just the. Um, the day of you know a police officer it was cool uh outside of feeling like uh, i might not want to show up in oakland for like a couple of days you guys are good you guys <laughs> don't live out here but hey, um no go ahead no i was just gonna say i just want to let the group know so desmond was not in one of those cars that's got a cage in it it was it was just it was a cage less car so it was like a it's a regular car. He was, it was a crown in the back seat. Where like, it was, it was, it was it a crown big vet, Des, or was it a? Uh, I think so. A, 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 I looked very, SUV. I looked very yeah. safe and comfortable. <laughs> 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 like I was like at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, it was cool. It was cool, and um, I guess just to close things is I'm I'm happy this we were able to do this. I definitely want to carry this conversation. Um, I think it'll be good to have another one next week if uh, we can line up the schedules again. And um, I'm super grateful for it. Cool. Right on. Much love, you guys. Much love. We'll 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 uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll coordinate for sure. Um, we can use my account, and and it's it's unlimited. So um, we'll, talk, we'll talk next time. We'll talk next time. <laughs> my bad, Brian. <laughs> I was just saying, hopefully, hopefully his account is better than his speaker. <laughs> Terrible. I was, just, I, was just praising, I was just praising a Comcast dude, too. I need to uh, get him back in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Take care. Thank All you right, so hey, thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. all right, see you guys.